Okay, Under the Sun listeners, we are back for another episode of the Art and Science of Coaching. And in this one, we have a guest with us today, Matt Zimmer, who you've heard before on this podcast. He's back again for another episode, but he's going to join the cast of coaches, myself and Zach Gregg. Matt, thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me back. I think uh, this might be a little more of a learning experience for the listeners rather than our last topic when my friend got left in Nebraska. So, Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if he's got uh, some follow-up stories, maybe we'll touch on that at the end of the show. Yeah. But appreciate you coming back and joining us in this new format of things. And, uh, you know, since, since we last uh, talked, well, even back then, way back then, you know, since you've been a professional cyclist, you have begun to coach athletes and, and you're also a coach uh, and you're knee deep in that as much as you are uh, training as a professional cyclist. And so we wanted to have you on here to uh, to add some input and some value to the discussion of things that Zach and I are going to talk about. Zach, you're back again. Uh, glad you're here. here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to get after it, get straight into it. So um, the way we do it is we, uh, we pose a question of things that we talk with our athletes about or questions that come up in our conversations that they have for us. Uh, we give our off the top of our head organic answer as best as we possibly can that comes from the perspective of science as well as uh, just the art of coaching and, uh, and try to give you some takeaways that you can learn uh, through those answers and stories that we tell. So, okay, let's get going. Who wants to take the first question? I'll save mine. Oh, and I've got a, I've got a bonus question at the end I didn't tell you both about. It's oh, a fun question, though. It's very unscientific. Let's let our guest start. Okay. All right. Matt? You want me to go with the, the question I got to ask today? Yes. Yes. Let's All go. right. So um, a guy I've coached for the last year and a half um, put a little Instagram story up saying I was going to be on the podcast and had people shoot me some questions that I mean, half of them are just jokes, but I uh, got a few serious ones. And I think this one's, this one's pretty good because it can be um, relatable for everybody. And he asked, uh, number one thing someone can do without spending any money to improve their training or recovery. So this one, I feel like it's pretty open-ended. There's probably a hundred different answers. This is more of an art answer, I think. You know, in, in, when you get right down to it, because you're going to need to be creative. But uh, I want to hear from you guys first. You know, what, what are your thoughts about that, especially being as experienced as you are as uh, elite level professional cyclists? You have had to learn by experience as well as uh, hearing stories from others. And then there's just that osmotic process of, oh, so this is what worked and what didn't. And we all love free. So uh, that's the boundary. Uh, so what do you guys have? I'll let, I'll let Zach answer first because uh, I feel like my answer can tie us into our, our next topic. Yeah, okay. So when I think free, um, that I think that the number one thing that came to mind right off the bat was getting more and better quality sleep. I knew that was coming. Yeah, yep. bingo. It's easy we're... answer. <laughs> yep. yep. And uh, it's not an easy thing to do. It's no. like the million dollar answer to the free question, right? So how do you get better and more sweet? Um, and it, I think it becomes a question of how efficient can you be in your day, managing all the things we have to manage um, and putting yourself in primo condition to have an extra hour with your eyes closed every single day. Um, for a lot of people who have full-time jobs and families, that could be an hour of sleep at night. Um, if your schedule is a little bit more flexy, um, having an hour of sleep in the middle of the day, taking a nap is crucial. I wish I had time for a nap. Tim, we got to get a couch in our office, man. Mm. I feel like that would really put us on, you know, the elite ranks of collegiate cycling coaches in terms of fitness. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, more sleep is going to be the best thing. And when you are asleep, there's a couple things. Uh, to really like pay attention to. So that's how much light is coming into your room. Um, and I guess the 
the two that I really pay attention to, how much light coming into your room and how cold is your room, right? You don't want a steaming hot room with a bunch of beeping lights and blinking stuff and blue light melts your brain or whatever it is. Like you want it to be super dark and super cold. And, you know, if you can get eight and nine hours of sleep a night, it'll totally change the way that you recover and how prepared you are for your training. Well, I like yeah. that you talk about the uh, light side of things because I, well, temperature wise, what it's like, what, 66 degrees is your, like your optimal temperature for sleeping. So, so obviously most people have their thermostat set at like 70 probably in the winter. Um, ours is set at 60. Megan says 62. So, yeah. <laughs> Hey man, you come to my house, you better bundle up because it's going to yep. get down to 49. Yeah, that's fine with me. I, I'll sleep better. But on the other side of things, the light thing, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, I've read a few studies about they'll take a guy and have him sleep in total darkness and they'll have like just a slight bit of UV light shining on his foot and it will affect his like REM sleep cycle. Like it's your body's that sensitive to, to light, especially natural light. So yeah, having like blacked out curtains and stuff like that definitely makes a difference. And I mean, it's going to help you fall asleep faster. It's less distractions, assuming you're not on your phone and yeah, back to the blue light thing. So <clears throat> that's just how, how uh, sensitive your body is to light. Definitely believe in sleep hygiene. You know, your sleep hygiene is critical to achieving good quality sleep. And along with that, and the hygiene includes those things y'all mentioned about, it needs to be dark, it needs to be cooler. You shouldn't even really have a clock radio next to your bed. There should be no flashing lights, no lights of any kind. Uh, I would have your devices in another room if they're even anywhere near you or turned on. Um, you know, I've mentioned this to Zach and some others here in the recent past. Like I, I turn off my, he's laughing already. I turn <laughs> off my, I turn off my Wi-Fi. You know, I don't want anything to be interfering at all with my sleep. Uh, it's already you know tough enough so man you're gonna live to be at least 100 you know too long hopefully, man hopefully <laughs> yeah hopefully it works but uh you know yeah sleep hygiene and having a routine you need a routine when you sleep it's consistent sleep times that you go to bed and consistent wake times and you need to get into a rhythm uh to help you uh, you know sleep better have better rested sleep with less disturbances within your sleep. Hopefully through that, you'll achieve enough REM sleep. That's going to help with, um, you know, the mental side of things. And then you're going to get enough deep sleep where the actual recovery takes place. Just because you get nine hours of sleep doesn't mean you got enough deep sleep to help really promote all the growth that needs to take place. Cause that's when the growth really happens. So yeah, sleep hygiene and the routine are going to be crucial to just making it happen. And it might mean for the first little while of establishing the routine that you're laying in the bed for a little while before you fall asleep. But if you keep sending that same consistent message to yourself, and, and I think an important, important part to help establish that routine is through the night after you have dinner and maybe you enjoy a show or something like that on TV, is have a period where you're winding down. You're literally winding down. And that in, just includes everything that you're doing in the house or whatever activity is happening. And that you just want to just gradually bring yourself down to a level where your body's actually ready for some sleep. And you haven't been wired and doing lots of things uh, where your, your mental state is going to be in a heightened uh, state of awareness. You want to wind yourself down through the evening to prepare yourself to go to sleep and then establish that routine. And, and, and that will help you have better hygiene uh, through the night and wake up better rested, you know, and there's lots of different tools. We talked in the last episode of some tools that are out there on the open market to help you measure your sleep. So yeah, that would be at the top of the list. Uh, what are some other free ways? I have a good one. I think that would, that I think it's free. Uh, and, and that's just, uh, that's yoga yoga and stretching, uh, you know, which is something that I think is important for cyclists. Whether you want to call it yoga, you want to just be someone who enjoys stretching, either one, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think that can be used wisely two or three days a week, if not more. 
if you're targeting certain aspects of the body, especially the hips. I see the hips as a, a key area to help unlock strength. Mine are uh, so bad. Do, oh, well, they're, they're I have crucial. the worst hips. It, it, it like affects everything I do. Or like I get so driven on training on just being robotic that like I neglect stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing. I'll like band work and just random little stretches just to keep your hip flexors open, how much better you feel day after day. And it's, I mean, that goes back to people with sleep alone. You know, you can't, a lot of people are picking and choosing, you know, what's, what's going to help me more that I can do with my time rather than sleep. Like not everyone can just get nine hours of sleep, you know, especially if you're working nine to five and you've got family obligations. And I mean, my sleep cycle, just from my side of things um like tomorrow uh i'll be up at probably 4 a.m and be on the bike before five Mm. uh and then you know my off days i'm not going to get on the bike till 10 so that's like you know i'll let myself wake up naturally versus have an alarm to get me on my bike just with working at the bike shop and stuff right now just having set hours i can only there's only so much time in the day that i can squeeze in my ride so i think that's relatable for probably a lot of people that listen to this is just you can't just have more time in the day to sleep or take a nap or um like for me you know i got to be to work by 8 30 or yeah 8 30 8 45 um or sorry 9 45 and then i'm not home till 7 30 so on a full work day that leaves me if i'm gonna get any quality of riding in especially somebody like me where i'm a high fatigue rider i if i don't have that fatigue i i can train all i want i just won't be that fast so i have to kind of pick and choose my battles and uh kind of just a lot of it i think too is just listening to your body you know like i i have some really good days on you know six hours of sleep or whatever five and a half hours of sleep not that it's ideal it's definitely not ideal but it's just like what i have to do now and uh it'll pay off in the summertime yeah yeah well it's an important piece. And, and like you said, yeah, you can get by, but it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be optimal. Um, yeah. Training, training isn't going to be optimal, but that's sort of a trade-off that you have to make at this time. And, you know, and like you said, everyone's got different obligations to tend to and deal with. And, uh, you know, we don't have unlimited supply of even, you know, and even if you did have an unlimited supply, it, it is a habit you have to develop you know, to be able to sleep a, a really long time or get enough sleep. So, um, yeah, but, you know, those two things, uh, yoga, stretching, sleep, what else would be on that list? And the good thing with yoga is it's quick. Like you can, like you can get a lot of deep stretching in, in only 30 minutes, you know, that's something that even time crunched athletes can fit 30 minutes and it's skipping your favorite TV show three times a week, you know? Um, it's one episode of the office. So it's pretty easy to kind of squeeze in something like that, where it's going to pay off big time, just stretching, stretching, open your body, talking about the hip flexor stuff. So I think the question yeah, would be like, when do you, when do you, I know when I do it, but when, how, when do you fit it in? Um, so I've been back to like what I was saying before, I've been just like hammering it out, not do just neglect basically. And I feel good and fine. But this morning I, uh, I rode just an hour and a half, super easy on the trainer. And then afterwards I, I did like 15, 20 minutes of core and then stretched for 20 or 30 minutes for hopping in the shower and going to work. So just, I guess, finding your habit, like just making it, putting it in your training, like in training peaks, making sure it's something visible, something accountable. It's not just, Oh, I'm going to stretch starting Mondays and then Tuesday hits and you skip one day. And then you're like, okay, you know, I think finding your habit is, like consistency is king. Like the more consistent you get at, the more important it becomes, you'll get it done if it's important to you. So, and then just seeing the training benefits come later on will only reinforce the reasons why you're doing it. So like for me, it's usually the, in the mornings. Yeah. I love the scheduling component. I think that is something, uh, having, having a moment where it's a consistent point where you do it. You know? yeah. And I think that's, what's worked for me. Uh, I do mine, uh, usually on my active recovery days, right? You know, whatever ride it is I'm doing. And then at some point during that day, usually in the evening, uh, I will, my routine, I've been able to do between 15 and 20 minutes and you can make it longer if you're, if you're up for it and you feel like it. Uh, and I, I kind of do my core Pilates 
like work separate from my yoga routine. Yeah. But uh, try to do those things uh, on active recovery days and uh, have that have that as part of my recovery and open myself up a little bit. And uh, I find that beneficial. What about you, Zach? Oh man, I'm the opposite. <laughs> The, the harder the workout, the more I prioritize stretching right afterwards. Um, and that's one of, a, one of the big things uh, uh, across several coaches that I've worked with is like, man, the ride doesn't end until you've done your stretching. You know, if, if you're like stoked on this like crazy ride that you did and like you're all, you know, you and all your buddies are high fiving and everything, uh, ride's not done, brother, until you stretch. Because those high fatigue days, are when you are going to tighten up the most um, and when you receive the most benefit from spending time stretching. So here's your science part of this. Um, what, your body loves stretching, right? You get a, a dopamine hit from stretching. Your body like absolutely adores it. And one of the positive things that you get from stretching is an increased um, angiogenetic effect. So your body will increase capillary density more frequently and to a higher degree in a recently stretched muscle. Um, and you can look at this because they're using it in rehab tools for like highly injured people. Um, and that's where a lot of this research comes from. But um, if you're stretching your quads and your hamstrings and there's things that are like highly oxidative during your rides, right after your ride, you are facilitating further capillary density and capillary growth over, mm -hmm. you know, who knows if this, if it's 1% over two years, we do it right. Like who knows how long it takes or to what effect it actually is, but it's a documented thing. Um, so, you know, Matt and I are both kind of the same in that we're like high load, super like uh, high TSS kind of riders in that some, some days it, it feels like it takes three or four hours of hard riding to actually feel like you've, you've accomplished something. So um, I take those days very seriously and make sure that even if I have to cut my ride 10 minutes short before I get in the shower and go to work or whatever it is that I have later in the day, I get a good stretch in. Um, because sitting in an office chair after doing a four hour ride with some strength endurance efforts in it <laughs> is going to take you half an hour of foam rolling that night to loosen back up. So, you know, prioritizing that kind of stuff. Um, and that kind of like, that kind of goes into, I think my last point on free um, is routine and scheduling and planning. And the better that you can do and the more detailed you are with your planning and your preparation and things throughout your whole day, the more you're actually going to gain from each activity that you do. Um, you know, Matt and I work with like some old folks and we work with some really young folks. So one of the, one of the problems with a lot of people is that they just can't get on their bike prepared to do their workout. They've got life stress. They've got things going on all the time, running around hundred miles an hour. Um, and something is always, uh, happening so that they're 90 or 95% when they get on their bike. What, what would happen if you were hundred percent every single time you got on your bike? What if, what if you just planned your day a little bit better? And I know this is like totally idealized, right? Like there's some there's some guy who's like 35, three kids, does great in business, who's just rolling his eyes right now. Yeah, right? walk but, him out of my shoes, dude. Yeah. <laughs> but if you could prepare better and be, you know, have a meal in you two, three hours beforehand, be properly hydrated throughout the day, schedule your training before stressful events in your life where you're having to make a lot of decisions during the day so that you are mentally fresh and physically prepared to ride, that's a gain hundred times out of a hundred, that's a game. And that's going to lead to better training and more quality training within the same amount of hours that you're committing to riding mm -hmm. your bike. And that's, that's prioritizing, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it really is. It boils down to prioritize. It doesn't matter what level you're at, where you are in your development. And uh, it just takes some of us longer to prioritize better. And then you get to a point where, you know, you've extracted all the, the real gains out of it now it's just such a habit you have to do it to just maintain where you're at and look for new ways to improve and get better but these things we're talking about really you know for the non-professional from say 
amateur level on down at all levels, those are things that if they do it, they can make some huge gains with. They have the opportunity to make some really big gains with a stretching routine, uh, a, having good sleep hygiene and getting enough hours of sleep. I'm going to throw one more at you. This is one of a don't. You talk about, we always talk about here's do this and do that. That's going to help you. I'll give you one to don't do. All right. This doesn't cost this anything either. This is just as long. <laughs> no, no, this is real simple. Uh, this is a tough one for cyclists, okay, to let go of. And it's a simple don't do. And that is alcohol. Say You're no. saving them money right now. Bingo. Yes, I'm putting dollars in your pocket. Say no to alcohol. You want to recover better? Say no to alcohol. It's as simple as that. It affects your sleep. Uh, it, it just it will affect your recovery. Uh, yeah, it's fun. It's nice to sit around with your friends and have a drink and and unwind. And, you know, hey, it's cool. It's great. But, you know, you at least have to be honest with yourself, knowing that it's not helping you perform better at all. But isn't it, it just carbs? Carbs are good for you, right? <laughs> Well, it's also hydration, you know, the weatherman oh, said yeah. to hydrate, you know, so, uh, but that's a don't, you know, and I, we probably could think of a few other don'ts, uh, but uh, that's a free one. And like you said, Zach, yeah, you're going to put money in your pocket by, by just avoiding that. Maybe there's a time for it, but there's definitely, you know, there's times when you should not do it uh, in accordance to your training. And if you could kick the habit entirely, uh, you will see lots of gains long term from abstaining from alcohol. And I think that's the hard part for, you know, the average cyclist or athlete is, you know, you listen to stuff like this and there's, you just hear, there's so many things that we can throw out. And I think, at least from what I've seen, like a lot of the guys that are just starting up or it's their first time with a coach or first time doing structured training up, it's not just two group rides a week where I get dropped and, ride as long as I can on Sunday before my wife and kids are mad at me. Um, they just try to implement too many of these things at once. Mm -hmm. And it's so many alter, like so many changes to their normal routine that it's just not sustainable for them. Cause they, they make it two weeks and you know, for them, there's no end in sight. Cause this is now the new normal for them. So I think trying to just pick like, all right, Hey, let's focus on like, I try to, I've been trying to do a better job as a coach putting in like weekly goals for my athletes. And it's like, Hey, we're going to focus on getting those 10 minutes of stretching in. We're going to focus on getting back in the gym where you don't worry about the weight. I just want you going through the motions. Like, yeah, you're, I'm sure you're going to be embarrassed because you're in high school and you know, no one understands cycling and you're not doing any weight in the gym. So it looks like you're, I mean, Tim knows about this. So it's just having like, just going through the motions and getting started and getting your baseline figured out and then figuring out, what you can sustain after kind of figuring out your new normal, but just add like layering it slowly. Like, all right, first week I'm going to focus on stretching. And after two weeks of, you know, I've got this down, this is normal. This is what I can do after riding. All right, let's focus on, you know, my hydration during the day. And then next week we'll focus on getting into the gym regularly. And you just slowly get that snowball effect where, you know, you look back from three years and it's like, okay, I remember when this was a big day and this was it, but it's like, okay, now I'm doing all this extra stuff off the bike and it's paying off with X power numbers or X results in races. So I think trying to just keep your consistency, but building your consistency as well is um, super important. So oh, if we, if all three of us think back to when we first got into this sport and the habits we had back then, oh, it's like last year for Zach. <laughs> and, and how different we are as people in the habits that we have now and what's normal for us now. Uh, it's a dramatic difference. And like you say, it takes time to uh, pivot from one way of doing things to a new one. And you certainly don't want to do everything all at once. It's too much of a, of a shift. And, but if you can incorporate those slowly over time, one by one, pretty soon you look up and you've left behind a lot of bad habits and you've adopted some new ones and uh, we'll get you going in the right direction. Um, and I, I, all right, I got two more. We don't, I don't think the three of us have much experience with these two, but you know, to a little bit extent I've done some and, and those would be uh, breathing exercises as well as meditation. Those are, those are two good things to incorporate 
uh, and I have at times mostly breathing as opposed to meditation. Uh, but I think those are also two free things to do that are going to help create some balance and reduce the stress uh, and help, in, in fact, help you recover a little bit better. Uh, take advantage of those times when you're in a parasympathetic state and, and, and healing and growing uh, so you can be ready when you want to be ready. And that's what we all want is we want balance, but we also want to be able to go into uh, uh, work mode and attack mode when the training calls for it or the racing calls for it. So those two things I know are beneficial for, for different types of people. Well, there's studies that show that um, meditating, like let's say you're going into the state time trial championships and you're constantly running the course through in your head and you're picturing like, <clears throat> this is how I'm going to hit this turn. This is how I'm going to go out of the starting gate. I'm going to hit the first turn like this. I'm, this is how I'm going to look on the bike. I'm going to really focus on staying super tucked and having my hands high and keeping my head down. And I'm going to eat this breakfast and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take a drink of water at the first U-turn. They say all that stuff. Like there's studies that show your mind can't differentiate the difference between what you're, what you've thought and what the real life event is. So if you can trick your mind, it's already done it a hundred times by the time you're going down the starting ramp. The race is always the easiest part. Training's harder than racing, like all the prep work, getting on the bike. And once they say go, that's the easiest part. You've done everything. Are, you can do. Yeah. And you're really touching on visualization and just yeah. really thinking it through and planning it through. And, you know, those are all awesome as well, because, you know, those, if, if you plan it, and you've thought it out, and you rehearse it, not just once, you rehearse it again, and again, and again, yeah, it's just like you did it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you will execute when the time comes, and uh, that brings up what you just described, brings up one more important one, I think, of a, of a don't do, uh, to help you recover better, and to help you just perform better at everything, and that is, it's real simple, but very difficult to do, uh, because I think this also plays into the visualization of what you're just talking about. Uh, and that is don't be negative. No negativity. Don't be negative. Uh, don't beat yourself up. Don't say stupid things and bad things and negative things out loud. Uh, because just like you were describing just now about visualization, about what it is you want to do and do effectively, you plant those seeds of doubt inside your head and the negative thoughts, or you say them out, especially if you say them out loud, the more powerful. If you do that, you're doing the same exact thing as that positive visualization that you're talking about. You're planting negative seeds in your head, and it's going to lead to bad outcomes, and it just is going to affect how you feel about and think about everything. And I've even got a story with that. Like, you know, how many summers did I come stay at Chateau de Hall up in up beach mountain and just train my brains out for like one one exact like one specific race of the year like every year was targeting that one day uci race up in Reading, pennsylvania and remember i had a teammate staying and he goes well you're doing all this prep but what happens if you flat and i go i don't know it's not an option i that's not that's not a thought that was never a thought until you said it and it's still not a thought because it's not going to happen he's like well what if you do and i'm like well it's not going to happen I didn't flat. Like, it was just like, <laughs> it was just funny that shows you even at this level, the different mindsets, even mm -hmm. amongst one team, it's like, how did you get to this level? If you always thought I can't win, I don't know why I'm here. Or, like this is too hard or I'm probably going to get sick. Or those are the people that do get sick and never win a race. And they get stuck in that plateau of negativity i mean i try not even to use the word work when i go to the bike shop i just say oh i got to go to the shop today from 10 to 7 rather than saying work because i think work has like a negative connotation to it so even just little things like that you know you can just trick your mind yeah well there's a lot of little things i mean yeah we started out and we only had maybe two things that we were going to talk about and as <laughs> we've spoken we realized there's yeah it's endless it really is endless you know of things that don't cost anything that you could do different and better and be successful. All right. So should we recap what our free, free things are? We should. Yeah. All right. So I had sleep. Matt, we had, uh, stretching. what do we have? We had stretching, sleep, uh, um, visualization, visualization, meditation. We had no alcohol. 
No alcohol. no alcohol. You know how many people you're going to save in Des Moines? <laughs> this is such a social, like the biggest bike group here. They go out like four times a week. Like I have to like ignore phone calls. Cause I'm like, Oh man, I know what's happening here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be out till 2 AM in spandex. Yeah. And no negativity. And no negativity. That up. That's just a few. So, all right. Those are good. All right. First and, question. And the people got to remember, like, there's not just like that one secret thing that the world tour guys do that you don't do. I think that's the, one of the biggest things is like people are always chasing the fast fix. And it's like, man, if you just from a strict, like, you know, number standpoint, if you want to look at it that critically, go look at like, what, like look at my power profiles from the last eight years and see how it's progressed. Like it is slow and it takes so much time at this sport and the faster you get, the harder it becomes because what got you here won't get you there. So it's, you know, it's all finding those little things that are going to make, yeah, it's like Zach said, that 1% over two years, that's still 1% you didn't have before. And I mean, if you're, if you ride Zwift and you're doing their workouts and stuff and you can do the bias where it starts you at hundred percent bias, go change it like one or 2% when you're hurting pretty bad. That is a lot of Watts. Like that hurts a lot. Like you are, I mean, you're feathering between four or 5% every single day. So looking just for that consistent 1% is huge. And, I, and Zach and I are both in a spot where, you know, neither one of us have plateaued, I wouldn't say, but you're, you, it's always like, okay, I got to find a different way to do this, but somehow get a better outcome. Like just adding that 1% more. So, you know, not searching for that end all be all like, oh, I started taking this smoothie and this supplement. And now I'm like, look at me, this, this was the secret. So I think that's a huge one that I it, it's yeah that and people changing too many things at once so just consistent get get good at one thing first yeah you yep. know nail it and then move on to the next thing yeah yeah that's good that's good okay let's go on to the next question Zach okay I'm gonna pull one from our list let's talk about what to eat on the bike how much. What is the breakdown of what you're eating per hour and why? This so is a good one because you guys out. both have the best experience of you get all these freshmen coming in. You take them on that first like three or four hour ride in the mountains and they're they're just burning the fuse way too hot at the start. And you're like, all right, I see you got full bottles and you got full bottles. And I've had five rice cakes sitting at the back. Like we're going to see who feels good when we hit the final climb. Cause you know, what's coming, but they don't. <laughs> well, and for context for all the viewers is Matt is like legendary for this on <laughs> LMC team camp rides. He, a few he kids knows exactly who's got enough ho-hos in their pocket <laughs> to make it for the five hours that he's planning that he didn't tell anybody about. So, and we're, and we're going to sort of steer this <laughs> initially off. Steer it on the sort of the conversation on, you know, what does it take during training rides? You know, what is it? What sort of practices should you have? How do you figure it out? What kind of foods to eat? What's the breakdown of calories and carbs? And, and how are you just going to fuel yourself properly to execute the workout? And then, you know, the racing is is different, you know, how you how you're actually going to execute on the racing. So, Zach, the science, take it away. OK. So let's talk very basic and then we'll, we'll get in the weeds. I know, I know Matt is, is ready to get in the weeds. So your body uses two primary fuel sources anytime you're pedaling your bike. You either are using carbohydrates or fats and both of those turn into ATP, which is the fuel source for your muscles that push the pedals. It's also the fuel source that keeps your heart beating. It keeps energy in your arms to hold onto the bike. So we're not just talking about some secret sauce that's pushing those pedals, right? So your body can use carbohydrates and fats in different amounts because they are limited by the amount each kind of either carbohydrate or fat can be turned into ATP within a given time span. So what I'm saying is fat is a very efficient fuel, but you can turn it into energy slowly where carbohydrate is slightly less efficient, but it can be transformed into energy more quickly. And the thing that we always need to like be aware of is that we have an infinite amount of fat and an 
finite amount of carbohydrate. And even with our finite amount of carbohydrate, if we're eating all the sugar in the world, we can only turn so much of it into energy within an hour. So with all that said, the objective is to save those carbohydrates and the subsequent fuel that they can provide our muscles for when we really need them. So we wanna lean on fat for as much of our riding and our racing as possible. And so there's a couple different ways to do this. Um, we just either train our body to get better at burning fat. We create a larger store of those carbohydrates called glycogen in our muscles, or we kind of do a combination of both, right? So we, we train our body to use this mixed fuel more efficiently over a long period of time and we ingest carbohydrate and keep adding fuel and keep adding extra sources of energy to burn uh, throughout our ride. So with that being said, um, we really want to focus on uh, the fats first, right? So whenever um, we start out training, we train at a low intensity, right? So that's a low energy demand and therefore we can use those fats more than we, and we don't have to rely on the carbohydrates, sorry. Um, so in, in that process, we still need some of that carbohydrate because we're not hundred percent efficient. And when we need that carbohydrate and we don't have any, that's when we get that bonking feeling. Um, and so like over time, we really like, sorry, I'm getting off topic, man. There's people behind me. Let me restart for a second. <laughs> You're um, good. No, you're going in the right direction. You're going in the right direction. Yeah, so Keep going. Keep basically going. we have a finite amount of energy <laughs> that we can ingest per hour to add to this big pot of energy that we have in our bodies. And more fit cyclists are better at turning the energy that they're eating and the energy they're storing into power in their legs. So how do we do that? And how do we train that? Well, it's all about the mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of your cells it's what's going to take whatever fuel source you give it and turn it into energy to turn those pedals. Um, and so basically through repetition, our mitochondria are getting the signals to burn this energy. And if it can't do a good enough job of it over a long enough time, it gets signals to make more and more efficient mitochondria. And so those little tiny signals over days, weeks, months, years of training, are how we become more and more effective cyclists. Um, so when you're starting out, you're not going to be very efficient. You're not gonna be able to use, utilize a lot of your fat stores in order to turn those pedals. You're gonna be reliant on carbohydrate. So you have to get into this habit of consuming carbohydrate throughout your rides. So how much? Um, so typically your gut can handle 60 grams of carbohydrate from one source within one hour. So think of two gels, right? And at maximum, after you've trained your gut, you can absorb 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour. It's 360 calories. Um, one gram of carbohydrate, four grams, or yeah, one gram of carbohydrate is four calories. So um, that's kind of the upper limit. That's where you actually need to kind of pay attention. Um, that's a fuel mixture of both hard and fructose. And if you mess it up, you get a tummy ache. So <laughs> with- It is hard. Right. It's hard. And that is a lot of food. So think of 360 calories of anything. It's an entire sandwich. It's three bananas. Um, and when you're an endurance cyclist, you're going for three or four hours. So you're gonna need 10 bananas. Um, and so it's very difficult. So with all of that being said, how do we best fuel to provide energy for our engine so that we can use fat and carbohydrate to provide a constant stimulus over a three, four, five hour ride? And I, going back to when you talked about, you know, starting out utilizing these fat storage stores and stuff. I mean, we all get that same feeling. You, you get that kick in the nuts a few times when you, <laughs> when you take your off season you take a month three weeks yep. four weeks five weeks off the bike and you come back on man i crack it takes me like 
after two hours, I'm fried. Like I am, I remember this off season coming back. I started back up in November. The first three hour ride I did, I was like on the side of the road, like 15 minutes from home. And I was like, I don't know if I can pedal this last 15 minutes. And I wasn't even riding hard. You're just, your body just loses that efficiency and it goes back. So you got to kind of build that up. So yeah, we all get that like quick little reminder what it's, you take it for granted when you're uh, fit and able to convert energy. Right. And so in an untrained state, you also store less glycogen on your body. Your energy stores just when you're walking around are lower. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is you don't need it in everyday life. So if you've taken a couple of weeks off the bike or you're just ramping up your training volume because it's important, it's that time of year, you've got extra time to train, it's going to take several weeks for you to start feeling efficient later into these rides. Um, because you just physically don't store extra when you don't need to. Your body's not going to just, because we're very primitive, um, you know, we, we're basically cavemen in a futuristic society, right? So if we don't need it, we're not going to store it because that's not what's going to best help us survive. Um, so maybe let, let's touch on the numbers yep. side of things, you know, first say, well, how much calories do I have in storage, you know, to do, if I, in a perfect world, I start off, what am I, what do I have in storage? What can I rely on? Uh, how many calories an hour do I burn? What's it going to take to complete a, you know, two or three or four hour uh, training ride? Uh, do I need food in a two hour training ride? What sort of replenishment, how do those numbers break down uh, as you're doing it? And, you know, sort of the practical side of things. Mm -hmm. I think a good way to look at it is your intensity first off, because if you're, I mean, your body's going to store up to two hours of glycogen in your liver and muscles to begin with. So depending on your efforts, um, you know, a lot of people try to do three hours before a ride, they'll eat their breakfast or, you know, lunch or whatever. Uh, I actually, I try to stay pretty well topped off all the way through the start of my ride, especially if it, you know, this time you're doing constant tempo efforts and it turns into a four or five, six hour day pretty easily. And if you feel wrong, feel wrong and you go into the workout, you know, if you eat three hours beforehand, by the time you're an hour into your ride, that's four hours without food already. Um, so I try to kind of stay topped off. I'll eat, you know, my breakfast, maybe an hour, hour and a half beforehand. And you're talking, you know, five, six, 700 calories of oatmeal where it's super carbohydrate dense and that's your main fuel source. So that's something like I will do. And then depending on the duration and the efforts of the duration, cause you know, I mean, you guys all have worked with Ben, you know, he gives you these, you're doing 85%, 90% and you're doing two and a half hours of it in one ride. And it's broken up into two intervals where, I mean, yeah, it's not that hard to start, but midway through it's, I mean, you're breathing hard enough. Your, your, your body is under enough stress where trying to eat during that is really tough. And so, especially if you've got two intervals, you know, like if you, you, you can fake it through the first one all you want, but you know, the next interval is going to hurt. And then that goes on to, you know, you're not only feeling for that workout, you're feeling for the next day's workout as well, which I think a lot of people don't understand. Like when you get to those, I mean, I'm sure you guys have tons of um, kids at LMC that, you know, they stop eating. It, it's pretty easy for a lot of people just to kind of stop eating that last two hours, hour and a half. And that's going to affect your glycogen storage and buildups for the next day. So trying to stay on top of that and then um, just figuring out your routine, what's, what's good on your stomach. You know, I know Tim's a big believer of real food and studies show like real food rather than, you know, process like gels and stuff like that are really hard on your liver. Some people, I don't know how they do it. They don't get gut rot. They can just suffer through it. But, you know, I'm, I'm fully on board with, you know, making your own food. Um, I'll do like the, I don't know how you feel about them, Zach, the nut filled cliff bars. Those are, those are pretty mm -hmm. good. Um, and plus, you know, you're looking at those things have got 27 grams of carbs, but when you start breaking it down to like Zach said, you know, if you're eating 10 bananas on a ride, like you're going to get pretty sick and tired of bananas after a week or so, like it, you got to constantly change it up. So, you know, especially this time of year where you can pack a PB and J and it's not going to get just doused with sweat because it's cold out. So you can, you know, pack real food, um, make sandwiches, uh, English muffins, stuff like that, that is easy to eat. And then also if it tastes good, you're going to be more motivated to eat it. 
Um, and the hard part, I mean, I even struggle with this now is just when it's cold out trying to eat and drink, like the last thing I want to do when it's, you know, 30 degrees out, like it is today is stop and have to fill bottles. Cause then the sweat seeps in your clothing, you get cold and all of a sudden you're really uncomfortable and you're really far from home. So trying to stay disciplined, not only, you know, race days and training days, but, you know, depending on the weather permitted, um, it's just another challenge into training. Mm -hmm. You know, with the kids that we work with, it's when they come to us and have the experience, this isn't usually something even on their radar. Uh, and, oh, and it's not on the radar of a lot of people, you know, coming through the ranks of cat five, cat four, cat three. And you kind of, st you start getting into cat two, you begin to like, huh, uh, this is really more important hydration as well as calories. And so some of the things that at least I make them aware of, you know, especially if they have a power meter, uh, if they've got a power meter to begin to become knowledgeable of the difference between how many kilojoules they're going to burn in just an endurance ride per hour. Uh, how many kilojoules would they burn uh, in, a, in a tougher workout per hour over the course of time? You start to see these consistent numbers that pop up. You know, it could be 750 to 900 calories an hour for, for something that's endurance. Uh, the harder you go, like you said, Matt, the higher intensities are going to have a, a higher demand of calories. Okay, if I don't, if I start out and, you know, men have what, a couple thousand uh, calories stored, women have probably a little bit less than 2,000. It doesn't take but a couple hours and, and you're going to start getting into, if you're going hard, you're going to run out of energy soon. And, and that's where that, that fat adapted ability really is going to come into play. So I try to get them to put kilojoules on their main screen just to become aware of how many calories are you burning to do this work that you're doing. Now we're also drinking calories. We can't forget that. You know, usually there's some calories in our bottles. Uh, you know, we use scratch. There's roughly 80 calories uh, in each bottle that we drink. And so you add those together and try to encourage them to replenish. It's, this is, I won't say it's impossible, but it's nearly impossible to replenish roughly half of the calories that you burn per hour. But like Zach said, you know, if you can get enough carbs in uh, and, and do your best to stay ahead, you don't want to bonk. We've all bonked. It's all happened. You know, we've all experienced that. But get them into that habit of having a high level of awareness, how many calories they burn per hour. You know, what does it take? How many kilojoules does it take to win a national championship road race? How many people do you think know that? Oh man. Mm. Well, let's, let's define kilojoules real quick. Let's take a step okay. back. Yes. So, let's do that. Um, yeah. Let me add a little context. So like you said, Tim, you store, um, let's just say 2000 calories of muscle glycogen in your body that you can access to turn those cranks. Okay. And so like Matt said, if that's when the tank is on full, that's not an everyday situation. If you've had a hard day before that, or you just haven't eaten enough, then maybe that tank is only at 80%. And so those are the calories that you're relying on to turn the pedals uh, on any given day. Okay. And so that's the high octane. That's high octane. That's the high octane fuel. And what we do and why we eat is because we want to keep putting fuel into that tank. And when that tank reaches close to zero is when you start feeling that bonking, the shaky, the clamminess, dizziness, whatever, you need a Coke, right? So um, what we're trying to do by making people aware of kilojoules and why and how that relates to calories and muscle glycogen is that kilojoules is a measure of the watts on your bike translated into calories burned to create that power. And so there's like an efficiency factor in there of like 25%, right? So it's like, I don't remember the calculation, but we're not very efficient animals. We, about 25% of, um, what is it? Like 25% of what we actually burn gets put in the cranks. So that's why it's not a perfect, uh, like, calculation but it's just like a car two, it's just like a car if a right. car has a thousand horsepower it actually has three thousand horsepower but two thousand of its heat you know all the stuff that the tires yeah exactly, exactly. it's heat yep. being dispersed it can't translate that all into mm -hmm. actual mm -hmm. horsepower 
And so, yeah. So if, if you're doing about 280 Watts in an hour, which is, you know, you're probably moving pretty quick, but that's about a thousand calories of burn an hour. And so it's very difficult to even get to 50% um, replenishment in that situation, right? So what happens if you go for five hours at that rate? Well, your tank is going to hit empty no matter how many calories you're putting in your mouth. And that is that bonking, that hitting that red line where you need to, you know, call a cab or whatever because you just can't turn the cranks anymore. And really, you don't want to get to that point um, because we store glycogen both in our active tissue and then in our liver. Um, and so you never really want to dig too deep into those liver glycogen stores um, because that's when you get into that low energy availability situation um, where you're just flat. You can't put out the power. You can't complete your intervals. Um, your sleep's probably affected at that point. Um, and you just feel crummy. So, you know, we actually have people who get in that state because they're just not paying attention to those things. So that's why we're harping on eating these sugary foods throughout your rides so that you're not tapping into stores that were made for something other than pedaling your bike. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a necessary thing, you know, I mean, like, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Like the first time I even, even thought of kilojoules or how many calories I burned, you know, during a race was uh, a long, long time ago. Uh, I think I've probably told both of you all this story about uh, finding myself in this wild three man breakaway at the Rome grown road race, uh, the Johnson city Omnium. And I was in over my head. I was punching above my weight. It was, it was the P one, two race and myself and two other guys rolled off the front the very beginning. They let us go. We got a massive gap. We had 10 minutes on everyone at the start of the mountain at the end. Uh, and I just went at my pace. We all went at our pace. And, and one guy from the break one and uh, didn't get caught until uh, three miles to go. So you can imagine I, the whole time I'm climbing this climb, I'm like, this is this is what what the matrix is broken. I mean, I, I, I'm, there's no way I should be getting on the podium at uh, at the wrong grown road race. But the first few people that passed me were all elite level pros and uh, the first one was both uh, LMC grads, one Brent Bookwalter. He was one of them. And another guy named uh, Scott Stewart. Uh, both were teammates here at Lee's McRae. And they come flying by me with three miles to go. And they were in pursuit of the guy who was in the lead. They didn't catch him. He went on to win. But after the race, uh, Brent saw me and I was talking to him. And the only question he asked me was, so man, how many kilojoules you burned? And I was like, and, I, and I'm like, uh, I don't even, I, I just threw me off of, of all the questions. And as it happened, my power meter battery died during the race. And I was, yeah, I was having to rely on heart rate the whole time. So I had no idea. I had no answer for him. It was the first time anyone had ever even said anything any, about kilojoules. It, that was the first thing that he asked me. And then that got me to thinking, huh, maybe that's something I should be paying attention to. Uh, and so I did, and it really helped me to better understand what my caloric needs were during training as well as racing. And, you know, like Zach said, it's tough in practice to make it, to, to do it right, the right way. And just even if you are on it to consume all that, it's a massive undertaking. But the closer you can get to the ideal situation, the better you're going to perform. And, uh, uh, you know, just the other day before a ride, I, I made up two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, cut them into, into four squares. And I looked up the labels of, of what the calories were for the bread, for the peanut butter, for the jam, and added it all up. Two sandwiches, 920 calories. Easy too. Oh yeah. 100, 125 carbs. Yeah. Uh, but I was riding five hours that day. 920 oh. calories, 920 calories is not enough. You know, so I had to I had to supplement that with some other things. And so you have to find the right food for you. I know, Matt, you love rice cakes. Uh, 
and and Zach, I never know what he's going to pull out of his pocket on some of these long rides, but he <laughs> always is prepared with a lot of food in his pocket. So what are some things that you all, when, you know, when you're doing those big days, a hard day uh, and or, uh, you know, or just a long endurance ride where, you know, you know, you're not pushing it too hard, but you're going long. I bet you if Brent would ask you how many goo clusters you burned that day, you'd be able to answer him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. No, but I guess back to the food thing. Um, I kind of knew what's available. Like <clears throat> our team has Cliff as a sponsor. So I really like their like nut filled Cliff bars and they've got enough flavors where, I mean, you can mix it up. You can do the smoothie ones. You can do the peanut butter, almond filled ones. Like th they're good. But I mean, even so it's like the banana thing. You get tired of them after a while. So I, I'm always changing what I'm doing. I really like doing the, like you mentioned, drink mix. Um, super easy way to stay hydrated and absorb carbs. And it's absorbed really quickly because it's already half broken down for you. Um, but I've, I would say a lot of times I'll be doing like pop tarts, PB and J's, uh, for a while in Tucson, I was making burritos. I would take like, just make little like sweet potato and rice burritos or just regular potatoes. So it's less fibrous. So it's easier to digest. Um, and then always those gas station stops. There's no telling what you're going to walk out of there with if you're you know, four or five hours into a ride. So I don't know. I just mix it up. I don't really have a, a go-to staple. I do like the rice cakes because it's easy. If you're, I mean, typically you've always got rice lying around or a new thing I've been doing around doing that. I learned from George Simpson is uh, he found a recipe for um, it's like a, basically like oatmeal cookies, but it's just bananas, chocolate chips and oats. And I'll add a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of brown sugar, and you bake, you just mash up the banana, add um, your brown sugar, add rolled oats, add chocolate chips, mix it all together. And I'll just make it, put it on a huge sheet pan and bake it for 10 minutes at 350 degrees. And it's literally like eating just oatmeal cookies. You're, you wouldn't know the difference. And that's something that, you know, you look forward to eating. It's, you know, three or 400 calories and basically a cookie essentially. So super easy to put down, easy to digest. It's very delicious. Usually they, they don't make it too many days i eat them as snacks off the bike and stuff so that's the hard part i think the key for that what you just described plus the rice cakes plus a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is it like you they're easy to chew they yeah. they almost melt in your mouth i think that's important uh i like cliff bars as well i like i like their uh their chocolate one and eat a lot of those when i'm training but you know you got you're a lot of chewing when you're chewing yeah. a cliff bar and they taste great but real food will go down much easier because it essentially melts in your mouth. And, and I think that's really helpful, uh, you know, in any type of training that you're doing and especially in a race, especially yeah. in a race. So Zach, what do you love to eat on the bike? Oh man. Sandwiches are, are probably the big one for me or, uh, uh, I hate to even admit it, but there's these like chocolate chip granola bars. Tim's probably seen these wrappers everywhere. <laughs> they come from uh, like BJ's wholesale. And they're like super soft and they're probably going to give you cancer, but like they're delicious and they're like 110 calories. So you can have two or three an hour and it's like a, a secret treat. But um, a lot of times I'll make like uh, Matt said, things with sweet potato or just potato in them. Uh, if you make your own like pumpkin bread, you can actually make mm. like four loaves pretty quickly. Um, and as long as you're using like a high quality flour, um, you can like cut it up and freeze it. And then just take them out. And by the time it's sitting in your pocket for 10, 15 minutes, it's like warm, it's soft, it tastes like cake. Um, and you're real excited for it. Um, but I try to do, yeah, kind of complex solid foods, especially in this part of the, the year, um, and then drink mix. So, um, you know, once we're getting into those, yeah, notorious two by 90 minute tempo sets and stuff, you've got to be kind of careful on, on what things you're eating and how they're impacting you. I still do not like doing goos or blocks or something like that um, during something like, you know, during a tempo effort. Um, I don't see the point. I'd like mm -hmm. to at least stress my gut a little bit and kind of reach that point where you're actually able to handle the whole food during those efforts um, and save the blocks and the things that you really look forward to for racing. That way you're super, super jazzed to eat them. And that's when those cliff bars and, and cliff products are, are in my pockets more often than not. And I'm just like, can't wait to, to dig into a, a bar or blocks or something like that in the middle of a race. Yeah. And I think also that sugary stuff you're, you guys are talking about, 
I think there's a time when you know, sometimes you get to the end of a ride. It could be end of a, a five-hour ride or if you've got an even longer ride where, you know what, you do need an extra kick. And, uh, you know, my, my, my thoughts on jails have changed just a little bit over the years because of just some practicality issues that we've run into with the team and, and getting them to eat on the bike during races and training, especially during races, uh, and making it a little bit easier. And we stress you know, real food for the, for the first two thirds of the race and maybe that last third when things are really throwing down where you might need a little extra kick and that, and that jail can do that for you. Or if you're in training, stop and, and yeah, give us something a little bit sweeter. That's more like a dessert. Or if you need a Mountain Dew, get a Mountain Dew, you know? Oh I man. Mean, the other day I had uh this is bad. Um, I was on like a five and a half hour ride. And it was one of those days I'm like, I'm just going to go out and smash myself into oblivion. And it just never happened. Like no matter how hard I kept going, I just kept feeling fine. And I was, I was on the, yeah, a thousand kilojoules an hour plan for five and a half hours and like three and a half hours. I, we stopped at a gas station. I was with a buddy just to get water and stuff. And I went for the uh, hostess zingers and that was good. Oh, it's 500 man. calories in three of those things. You know how easy it is to eat those? Ooh, oh man that was my that was that was enough though for like a long time you know you eat like that one thing on that long ride and you're like you know what that was I like those and if i'm doing something like that i'll grab those little small round pecan pies you know the the, the little debbie pie oh uh, man and crush those i mean oh. but i have to be in a i don't do it to do it there's there is a real reason like you know yeah. what i need this this is actually going to give me that boost because you know around here we're having to climb to get back home, you know, and it could be a 30 or 40 minute climb or if I'm riding from beach, it's like, I've got an hour's worth of climbing. I, I need a boost and uh, it can make a difference. It's not really what you, what you want to have to do, but yeah. sometimes you need to do. And uh, yeah. And I think that's a good point you brought up about the goose. Like I, I don't like goose really. Um, I don't like shot blocks, but um, I mean, there's plenty of, real life application like race scenarios where you have no choice like you're either going to eat that or you're not going to you're not going to be able to eat a piece of cake going up like you know if you're doing uh the last day of redlands like you're not going to be able to you you can only take in goose like that rate that stage is so hard that you are forced to you, i mean it's one of those days i don't have a single goo all week and it's a, what six day or five stages um of racing back to back to back. And when you get to the sunset loop that last day, I mean, it races like a crit, but it's four and a half hours long, 20 people finish every year. And that is like a perfect application where like, I will deal with the gut rot the next that night and the following day, just cause it's, you're on like almost survival. And if you try to pack anything big, I mean, you're going to be coughing up crumbs and it's just not going to work out. So that's like the perfect scenario to like, where I will resort to, you know, I'll have 12 gels in that race. And that's more than I have all year. And then, you know, a few stages are like that in the U S it seems to be the last, you know, the queen stages where you're really suffering or the team car has gone and you have no choice, but to pack something stuff that's going to fit in your pockets. Cause you can't just go back and feed like the last day of heel is like that. I mean, dudes are out there all over the place. And um, that's one where like, like another good one is uh, like the, uh, the gummy bears, the gummy bear mm -hmm. thing that Sagan started, the Haribo ones. If you do those, that's actually uh, glucose rather than corn syrup. Like that's a big thing to look for when you're looking for um, ride food. You don't want corn syrup. You want you want the glucose and stuff. So those are good. And you can kind of just let them sit in your mouth and you can let them kind of get soft. And those are tasty. So um, another ride food. And then also this goes back to our free advice. That's going to pay off huge. Like this is probably one of the biggest things is nutrition on the bike for day after day performance. And you will see benefits, especially, you know, I don't know if you wanted to roll into the topic of food after riding and um, you know, your whole glycogen window and all that stuff of when it's closing and um, kind of stuff to look for after post-workouts and post-races that are going to help you kind of recover for that next day. Yeah, well, you know, like in other sports, I mean, what the, you know, you hear the mantra more in, not in cycling, but in other sports is, you know, what you eat, what you're eating today, you play on tomorrow. And, and there's a lot of truth in that. 
And for us cyclists, especially for multi-day events, even if they are at the amateur level and it's a two-day onium or, you know, even, you know, yeah, two-day especially, you know, you are uh, hydrating and eating on Saturday for what also is going to take place on Sunday. And mm -hmm. you want to set yourself up for success. You don't want to get into that, that deficit like Zach was saying, because if you go too deep, too far, it's going to be very difficult for your body to recover from that, then sleep well, then be rested and recovered to come back and compete the next day. And so the key part is to practice these things in training, you know, have a good sense of what works for you, uh, how many calories can you consume, uh, and don't, you, don't get to the end of a race and afterwards say, I didn't have time. I couldn't do it. It was too crazy. It, 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 it was too hectic. It was too tense because all races are that way. You know, if you're racing good bike races against good competition, it's going to be tough to drink. It's going to be tough to eat. But you have to figure a way out and you have to figure it out and you've got to find a way to eat. Otherwise, you're not going to be that successful. So that starts in training and getting into the practice of trying different things, finding out what your limits are, finding out what works for you, and then put it into practice, you know, in the race. Uh, big believer in, you know, what, what you do in the race is, is, is going to hinge on what you actually practiced on. And you can do those things and find out what works for you and what, and what works for you, Matt, may not work for Zach. Uh, or what works for me may not work for you. You just need to find out what works for you. And if it does, and you are happy at the end of the race because you were successful, and you're like, yep, I drank exactly enough. I got the calories in. I had a good day. You know, I'm happy with it. And if it didn't work out your way, then figure out what went wrong and, and fix it. Yeah, I mean, there's like, you know, you can do that for the classic, you know, you're going to do 4,000 KJs at once training. And then after those 4,000 KJs go do like 20 minutes of threshold at once. Like you'll find out if you fueled properly or not, you're either going to be able to, I mean, you're going to fail five minutes in, or you're going to make it the whole way. And that's when you can, when you can really tell, like, I mean, we have it at training camps and stuff. You can just at our level, like guys that don't feel right. You know, if you're doing those six hour days down in Tucson and you're the hammer, the last two hours, like people are like, man, I don't know how you're doing this. And you're like, I don't just, did what I normally do. Like you find out quick, especially it's nice that we've all, you know, worked with Ben and day by day and stuff. And I think one of the best ways to find out, or like you said, Tim, you have to, you just have to make it happen. You have to eat. And if you don't, you're going to pay for it. Like doing those high endurance efforts where, I mean, you're on the verge of it being five watts too hard and 10 watts too easy. You go ride that for an hour and you, I mean, 20 minutes in, you better be eating something. I mean, you're half choking on stuff, but I mean, those little, uh, nature's bakery cliff bars or uh, fig bars, I'll eat those on a ride. And it takes me like 10 minutes during one of those intervals just to get those teeny little bars down. But it's just like, take a bite, let it sit, take a squirt of water, try to swallow it. So you find out real quick, uh, you, what routine is going to work for you when you are practicing it in training. So that's a, another big free tip to make you a lot better for next year and, and to your point about when you know it worked you know when you know you did it right i this is a simple thing i i know i think i've shared this with both of you is that when you get to you know let's say that for someone a three-hour ride is a stretch ride or maybe a four-hour ride is for a lot of people a three and a four-hour ride is a stretch ride for me or you two uh that's maybe not a stretch ride there's other volumes but if you can get to the end of what's sort of a big day for you uh, go, yeah, like you said, go try, especially around here, we have these climbs. Okay, get out of the saddle and just try to hold a certain pace for a while. What can you hold? You know, are you at your so-called uh, functional threshold or are you well below that? Uh, or can you ride above it? And that's going to give you a really good indicator of, oh man, I, I, I did everything right today or my strength and fitness is where it needs to be and I dialed in my hydration and my food the right way. If you get to the end of a ride, and this has happened to all of us, you get to the end, uh, and man, endurance is all you got, yeah. you know, and it might be the accumulation of the days leading up to it. It could be just about that day, but it's always a good indicator. Like if you get to the end of the ride uh, of a big day, uh, what try what you can do, you know, and it doesn't have to be all out. Just see what that upper limit is of your output 
and that's going to be a good indicator of did I did I do everything the right way throughout the ride? Because if you didn't, you won't be able to do it. You just won't. Uh, and so I've always used that around here, uh, and it's motivating for me when I dial it in right. You're like, holy crap! You know, oh, it feels so good. Yeah, you know, it's it's really validating and affirming. It motivates you and excites you, but man, when you don't get it right, oh boy. I mean, you're yeah. the guy that turns into, you're just in a terrible mood. You don't, I've had teammates like, you know, you're going up <laughs> lemon for like the second time and you're just sitting there like, yeah, man, this view is nice. Like, oh, look at the sun. Like, oh, geez, that bird. And they're just like, stop talking to me. I am not in the same mindset and mood as you. Like, just stop. Like I, they'll literally just be like, I'm struggling. Stop. Like you're not helping. You're annoying. You're not making this fun. And then you're like, oh, okay. Like <laughs> you want to eat something? I give you a bar. And they're like, no, I'm fine. You're like, all right. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, we all, it seems we have to learn things the hard way. And sometimes we're, we learn that lesson quick and we make adjustments and other times we have to be uh, beaten over the head with it before we finally get it. But when we get it, uh, you know, then we see the value in it and we'll keep doing it. So uh, I think that's an important part. Uh, yeah, for training and for racing. And, you know, the takeaway is, uh you know, yeah, eat, you know, take in calories, replace what you burn. And, and yeah, maybe there's, are, there are some workouts where you don't really need calories, where if it's a 90 minute or two hour ride and the effort level isn't, uh, you know, above 85 into 95 or hundred percent, but otherwise take in some calories and uh, your performance will improve. Yeah. And just so, e eating before you're hungry too. You got to remember, you're not just going to, Oh man, all of a sudden I'm hungry. I should probably eat something. It's like, Oh man, that, that you're way too late on that one. You know, eat before you're hungry and drink before you're thirsty is important on that first. And I mean, I have my little routine. Like if I'm doing a four or five hour day, I typically don't eat until like an hour in hour 15, but that's cause I'm starting off like so topped off where I'm like, all right, I, I'm like burping like the first 15 minutes from either too much espresso and too much food. So it's like just trying to dialing your routine is super important, especially before races. You know, one of the things that I took away from watching the Tour de France this year, then, you know, there was um, Simon Garens was one of the announcers and uh, the, the guy leading the commentary, you know, he throws questions out there uh, that, you know, the general public would like to hear. And he asked him something about, you know, the, the dietary habits of the riders, you know, before on, on race day in the mornings and during the race. And one of the things he said, I think is, is worth noting. And, and it's something, you know, I'm sure you guys, you alluded to it a little bit ago, uh, Matt, and it's something for all of us to consider is, yeah, you know, they wake up in the morning, they eat a big meal, they have a really big breakfast. But then after that, as they're leading up to the race, because they're in this long stage race and they're burning a massive amount of calories, that they're going to be snacking all throughout the morning leading up to that race. It's not like they eat a meal and then they have that window, like you said, Matt, of three or four hours in between. Uh, you, they cannot afford to do that. And I think there may be some instances where even at, you know, at, I know it is at your level, at the pro level, and even at the amateur level where, where maybe snacking, you know, is, is going to help you stay ahead. And, uh, you know, there could be a three or four hour window between when you eat when the racing really gets started and if you got some light snacks in between some fruit, some, you know, uh, uh, you know, a few bites, a half of a sandwich or something that's really going to hold, you know, help you keep that storage up that can make all the difference. And especially does for riders at the world, world tour level is that they just keep snacking all the time before the race starts. Uh, because as y'all seen, everyone's seen the first hour or uh, and sometimes even longer of uh, a professional race is insane you know they don't show it though they don't show it half no. the time but that's like the hardest part of the whole day and you don't yeah. see it yeah so i think that's an important have part. you have you guys seen the uh um sports and science like the sis uh little mini documentary they did with Froome when he won when he pulled off the zero win doing like that 80k solo breakaway like the most like epic win ever uh I have not seen that. No. Holy I think I've read the article, but I haven't seen the documentary. Yeah. I don't know if it's like a full, like, it, I, th I feel like it's like a 10 minute little mini thing. Mm -hmm. And um, the, like Froome brings it up to, uh, 
you know, the directors and stuff, Brailsford, all that the day before goes, Hey, I think I can go from, you know, 180 K out on this launch pad and I can win the overall of this grand tour. And they said the first thing and the most important thing they had to figure out was the fueling. It wasn't whether he could do it. It was how do we properly fuel you to get you 80 K at, I mean, he probably did 370 Watts and it's stage, you know, 20 of a grand tour. So he's in more fatigue than most humans will ever imagine. And to be able to pull off that kind of physical feat and in the little mini series or documentary, he's talking about how, when he started the day, he was so full and bloated and, but he's like, I knew I was going to burn, you know, he was talking, they was doing 80, 80 grams of carbs every 45 minutes in his bottles alone. Cause you know, he's going too hard. You're not gonna be able to eat. And it's how do I sustain, you know, a two and a half hour effort at just below threshold, like something that's attainable and he fueled right. And he won the race. Yeah. That's an extreme case. It's doable, but Holy cow, that's who, you know, but, but without that math, without knowing exactly how you were going to do it, you know, it's you're probably going to, it's probably not going to work. That plan won't work if you haven't done the homework. And that's just a cool little example that anyone listening can go watch the little 10 minute clip on it. And it's like, Oh, this puts it in perspective, how important this is. And granted it's an SIS ad and all this stuff, but still, <laughs> you know, like sky does not miss a beat with that stuff. No one on their team is cracking from improper fueling. Like that stuff is so ingrained. Like they have guys that, you know, I think that Boswell, Ian Boswell raced for them for two years. And when he left the team, he said the most important thing he was taking with him was, the dietary side of racing. It wasn't, you know, race strategies and we're going to do this and all these marginal gains. It was something at just sitting at the table and stuff on the bike and the little things that are free that you just have to implement on a daily training basis and in your races. So um, that's just something quick that you can see it's happening at that level. It's just like what we're talking about now, but obviously magnified. So mm, mm, mm. that's good. That's good. Okay. All right. You ready to move on? Yep. Last thing. Uh, all right. So I, I got a question after we posted our first episode. And it uh, came through Instagram. Uh, and it was, it said, do you have any advice or tips on becoming a cycling coach? I've taken the level three USA cycling exam a while back, but life got in the way. And now I'm determined to follow my passion. Um, and she wants to just progress in the sport, and she doesn't really say if it, you know if she wants to do this as a as a job, but it's it's a pursuit that she wants to follow. And so, yeah, how any advice or tips on becoming a cycling coach? And I got that one, and I thought, oh, wow, that's like these other things we're talking about. It's a really big question, and we we've, we've all been through it. You know, we, we've all been through it. Uh, mine started a long time ago. And I, and I will just kind of go through uh, sort of the art. Here's a few things, a lot of things that jump out to me. Uh, if you want to say advice and tips, I would say, one, if you can, and this person I know, I know this person and they've got a background in the sport. They've got, they've competed at a pretty high level. So they, they're bringing some experience to the table. So I think it's important to always, you know, lean on your experience. You, you've already got a, a lot of experience competing uh, and riding a bike and being in the sport and being around others who uh, are coaches. So lean on that experience. But when I think back to how I developed myself, um, I've been very fortunate to just have some really good influences. Uh, and first, I would say, try your best to find uh, a, a mentor, a local mentor that you can work with who has a tremendous amount of experience, uh, who has already seen a lot, has done a lot, uh, and who can share their insight and knowledge with you. I think that's important. I was very fortunate. My my first coach that I hired and worked with was a fantastic coach, still is. And, you know, he was uh, 
credentialed, highly credentialed. He's been a level one coach with USA Cycling for over 20 years, I bet. But he coached me for quite a few years and mentored me. And when we started working together, that wasn't the purpose of us, um, of the intention of why I hired him. It was I hired him because I wanted to get faster and stronger. And in the midst of that, I then became a coach uh, and jumped at the chance to coach a college team. And so when I did that, he, I, I just leaned into everything. I paid close attention to how he did everything, how he prescribed workouts, how he communicated with me, his methodologies. And so if you can lean on a local mentor, I, I found that to be hugely valuable. And we got to a point where he finally, he didn't fire me, but he let me go. <laughs> you know, he got, he's like, I've done everything I can for you as an athlete. You know, I've done everything I can for you. I think you can coach yourself from now on. Uh, but from then on, I still relied on him a lot to learn about things within the sport. Uh, so finding a mentor is important. And in the subsequent years, I have done the same thing with the friendships that I have uh, in this sport. Uh, be it, yeah, we talk about Ben Day a lot. He has been not just a close friend, but also a mentor when it comes to coaching and uh, physiology and the art of coaching. And he and I share ideas and ask questions of one another quite a bit. So I, I think having people that you can work with or work for and learn from. Another one for me is Hunter Allen. I worked for Peaks Coaching Group for a couple of years and learned a lot from Hunter as well as Tim Kusick because Tim was working for Hunter. Uh, when I worked with them, uh, learned a tremendous amount from both of them. So I've been very fortunate to have incredible influences in cycling. And that doesn't even include the previous coaching influences I had before I got into cycle, which were tremendous. Uh, so mentoring, I think, is key. That's a great way. Another way that I also did that, that I think this person can do and others can do is uh, if you want to coach and work with athletes, uh, one just inherent built-in way to do it is start a club team, you know, start a club team that, you know, maybe focuses on uh, young kids or uh, young adults and people new into the sport, especially new riders. I think new coaches will learn the most by working with riders who are new in the sport. And you have tons more experience and knowledge than they do if you already have a history of racing and been in the sport for a while you you're you're going to be light years ahead of where they are and you're going to have a lot to offer them and you can learn a lot for, and through coaching by working with new people in the sport but start a club team uh, and recruit riders and you don't necessarily have to recruit people that you are only riding training plans for but just that whole process because coaching isn't just about prescribing workouts, uh, as you two know and, and, and are learning. It's way more than that. That's just a small piece of what we do. So I think starting a, a club team, and it's fun. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's worth doing. And that's a great way to put your name out there, uh, that, that this is what you do and that you work with some of the people on the team and you're writing their training plans and you're just helping shape them off the bike and on the bike and and touching on some of these topics that we're talking about in this art and science podcast. Um, and, you know, some other things I think it's important to know is, uh, you know, on the science side, there's a lot of things I know that Zach could touch on that, that is crucial. I think for anyone who is prescribing workouts, there's so much you have to consider. Uh, I do believe in credentials. You know, I know there's a lot of coaches out there that don't believe in credentials. I personally do, uh, not because of the piece of paper you get, but because of the influences that come through it and the exposure you get to, uh, to, to bear witness to with these other people that are knowledgeable and have experience as exercise scientists or physiologists uh, or just as coaches. I mean, the, the one that is the, you know, the pioneer of coaching in cycling is Joe Friel. I mean, this guy, his story of essentially pioneering coaching endurance athletes, uh, it's worth 
it's yeah, it's worth if you can find a, a video or an audio of it, hear him tell that story. It's awesome how he did it, and uh, and get his I'd get his book, the Cyclist Training Bible, Bible, uh, the Cyclist Training Bible by Joe Creel. It's a great book, and it covers everything. It's one of the most comprehensive books for cycling coaches, uh, and it doesn't matter what level you're at. There's something that everybody can take in Joe Creel's book, and then um, another big influence of mine is. A lady in West Virginia, her name is Kristen Diffenbach. And this is really getting into the art of coaching and, 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 and the science of coaching itself, not training. But uh, she's got a great book. I know Zach has it. And, uh, you know, I, I hope to flip through it myself. It's called Coach Education Essentials. And that's what uh, she does. She uh, teaches coaching. She teaches coaches how to coach. And uh, so Kristen has been a big influence of mine over the years. And so I follow people like Joe and Kristen and other prominent cycling coaches, endurance sport coaches, physiologists, uh, exercise scientists, the information and content they put out there. I follow them so that I can stay on top of things. And it's one of those things where you just have to accumulate the knowledge gain experience and over time it just begins to add up and you you will learn through uh, that pursuit of knowledge but then the accumulation of the experience as a coach uh, will back up that knowledge you learn uh, and then you can apply it and so you have to take one step at a time one day at a time but there's a lot of really great content out there there's some great people out there to follow and uh, and and just dive in you just have it is a very intimidating thing uh to start as a cycling coach in in this industry if you want to call it that it is intimidating for everybody it doesn't matter if you're a male or a female my view is it's a bit intimidating like how, where do you get started like how do you even get plugged in how do you get a client uh you know and it's tough it's tough for everyone who starts it, but uh, those are just a few things that uh, pop into my mind. And that's not even talking about, well, OK, you, you have to have a heart for it. You have to really want to help other people like get better and improve. you got to enjoy that because their success, it's, it's theirs. They own that success. You as a coach don't own that success. They do. But you got to enjoy helping them succeed and get better and uh you know experience the sport gotta have patience gotta be flexible gotta be open-minded like you, you know i was thinking about something today after mine and ben's conversation or podcast we we recorded the other day and it's how i was this way when i first got into coaching i saw everything as black and white you know there's the the everything is black and white and there's a uh, there's an approach that you take and you especially learn this and it gets beat into your head if you come from a, a, a ball sport background, which is where I come from. And I know that you guys come from sort of that background, too. And, and everything is black and white. And what I've learned over the years is that a lot is a lot is black and white, but you had better be able to work in the gray an awful lot. If you cannot work in the gray, you're going to have a hard time in coaching because when you're coaching, you're working with people. And when you're working with people, they can be unpredictable and you can't control people, but you have to work with them. You have to adapt. And, and that's where the, the be flexible, be open-minded uh, and, and don't be so rigid and black and white, work in the gray. So uh, yeah, start that journey because it's a lot of fun. And I started in 2005, never would have imagined in 2020, I'm still getting after it and I enjoy it. I love it. And so I know you guys are really early in what you're doing. So those are the things for me that jump out. One, I will say one of the things I love about coaching too is helping other people become coaches and, and, and giving them some counsel and guidance. And I sure don't know. Uh, I don't know everything and I'm not an expert on anything, but I've experienced a lot. And I love sharing those experiences. And it's partly why I started a podcast is just to share stories. So would you I say, say 
would you say you have an intense burning desire towards coaching? Oh, Are you, you a beacon to, you for others? You had to pull that out. You had to pull that out. <laughs> Man, I feel that I do feel a responsibility to do that. But I feel that responsibility every single day as a person. So here's my thing. I learned this from my college coach. And that is, you know, I don't want to give someone a reason uh, to talk negatively of me. They may not like me. That's fine. But I'm not going to give them ammunition to say, ah, see, see that? Look, look at that hypocrite. I'm not, I'm not going to give someone that ammunition. It's not going to happen. So I've taken that approach in cycling and it's just, you know, it, it's hard. It is hard. It's really hard to do. And, but if you can do that in the long run, you know, people will at least respect you. And that's the hope. And so, uh, yeah, I do have intense burning desires. <laughs> and uh, I try to be that beacon because, you know, it's corny. This is corny. I'm going to say something corny. But there's times that I think, you know what? And you guys should think about this yourselves as professional cyclists. I thought about this when I was a professional baseball player is that in a given moment, as people are watching you, you might be the one example that they need to see that day. You, they may have seen nothing but bad examples all day long, but you might be the one good example they needed to see that day. So what example are you going to set for them? Is it going to be a good one or a bad one? And certainly I've lived life long enough to where I've, I've done some things that I shouldn't have done when I was younger, but you sort of wise up and realize what did that serve me? And it sure didn't serve any other, any other person. So um, yeah, I do try to be that and I'm not perfect. Uh, I'm not a saint, definitely a sinner, but I think, I think that plays into it. And I think it's important that coaches, there's certainly lots of news stories out there who of coaches who, don't do that. And I mean, there's plenty of stories of, of coaches doing, you know, just committing bad behavior, illegal behavior uh, uh, that involve abuse or uh, in some cases, death. You know, what happened with those football players? Was it in Maryland or uh, a couple years ago where they were just, they were being overworked and they weren't really being overseen in a proper manner. So, you know, it's a big responsibility. And, and so I take it serious, sometimes too serious, but, but I think it's, it's worth being serious about, you know, especially guys like you, you, you guys are growing up and these young ladies we have, like they're, they're pretty serious about what they're doing. And it's, I think it's important. We as coaches give them our best. I rambled way too long, didn't I? Did I surely y'all got something to add to this. So as, oh, as you two guys, as, as coaches, I mean, how did, how did you, Matt, I mean, how did, uh, how did you get into this? Why did you want to start helping people? Um, so my first client, I started working with him probably four years ago now, I think four. And uh, of co conveniently enough, he was the guy that got left in Nebraska. I still coach him to this day. <laughs> so yeah, he's been a trooper. Um, and a lot of it for me, it was just like, Hey, you think you could help me out with workouts? And what do you think uh, I could be doing better? And it was, it wasn't really like, Hey, I want you to coach me. Let's do this. It was like, all right, what, what can I, how can I use my time better? What are some workouts that you do that I can try to, you know, adopt and add to my routine. And so it kind of started out slowly like that. And then obviously it turned into payment and, you know, now it's, I, I wouldn't, I don't have a coaching company at all by any means, but I do coach, you know, a dozen people or so. Um, and it's kind of switched around throughout the years. And a lot of it for me, like, I guess, growing the business side of things was uh, just being good with people. Um, I'd say I'm definitely a people person. So you're, I, no, you are, you're a great conversationalist. You yeah, are, and I feel like that is a strength. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of that, like it even comes up at the bike shop where I'll be talking to somebody and it turns into I mean, I've gotten a few coaching clients just by word of mouth at work and it's, Oh, I'll go talk to Matt. He knows something about training and, you know, it's easy to sell bikes when you know about biking and especially high end stuff where it's like, Oh, Zach and I have been to the wind tunnel. So if you want to talk that I can, 
you know, it's easy to kind of have relatable subjects. And once they find out you race professionally, then it's even easier. And so then it's, it just builds your credibility as not only, you know, a coach, but a salesperson and stuff. So um, doing stuff like that helps. And then just a lot of word of mouth, like having success with your athletes and being able to understand where they're at and where they're going. And Hey, you're 55 years old. Here's what's attainable. Here's what I think we should shoot for. What do you think? Like, it's always a we conversation. Like they're hiring you to add to their team to make themselves better. You know what I mean? So understanding that side of things. And also there's the flip side of things where not everyone is coachable. Like I've had multiple athletes where it's like, Hey, you should read this book. And they send it to me and it's all about like managing and they're like, Hey, I think you just don't bring enough value. And I'm like, well, you also have only done two workouts in the last month. So like, you can't like, you know what I mean? Like they try to like nitpick your performance and it's like, I mean, consistency is king. It always wins. It, it can't lose. It always wins. So like sticking with the plan and understanding some people like coaching is just not for everybody. They have an idea. Like some people don't understand what it takes to be fast or get better. Like they're, it goes back to drinking. They're too busy. Oh, I do six group rides a week and we go to the bar every day after. Okay. Well then why would you hire me? What can, what value can I bring in that one extra day you have? Like, you know, I'm not going to let you go do all those group rides. And it's not that I don't want you to have fun. Is that the goal for you mm. is you want to do a 40 K in this amount of time, but you're not going to get there doing this. That's why you hired me. So, you know, once you start adding in the changes and they're changing their routine, I think you just have to know not everyone is good with a structured plan. I mean, so many people just go so far the other way. And then there's the opposite. I have guys that like every day in training peaks is green. It's like within a minute, like every single ride. And it's like, this guy's getting after it. And you know, the progression comes like you find they get better and just understanding the different athletes, athlete types. Like, you know, that goes back to the physiology of things like different, you know, genetic muscle makeups and stuff. You can't just, everyone can't just follow a cookie cutter plan. That's why you hire a coach. They look into your files, they figure out what you need. And you got to remember as a new coach, you're not just trying to prove somebody wrong. You know, it's like the customer is not always right, but making them feel wrong doesn't make it right. And it's not going to make you look any better regardless of the science you provided. And you know, you just have to kind of lead them along a path and over time they're going to get faster or they're going to understand why, why do we do certain things? Um, why can't I do Zwift braces five times a week? It's like, well, that doesn't leave. You're going too hard now versus, you know, what you were doing before. You're probably just riding, you know, the little ring all the way through March. No big ring until the spring. Um, you know, just kind of utilizing their time um, a little better. And then also, I think the biggest thing is just being a good leader and a motivator. And I mean, the big one of the biggest things is just accountability they know that if they slack off, they're getting a text from me like, Hey, what happened this day? Like, how come you only did two of the intervals and then quit? Or, you know what I mean? Like, and I've had periods of my training, like professionally, just not having a coach. And it's a lot easier to quit knowing no one's going to be looking at my file at the end of the day, other than me. Like I just let me down versus kind of the mental side of like, I'll let him down too. Cause I'm investing time. I'm investing energy. I'm paying him. And Zach knows like having a coach at this level, finding the right coach that, you know, they might build, they might bake the right cake for you, but they put the wrong frosting on it at the end of the day. Like all of that is super important in building that relationship of knowing your athlete and then also gaining their trust is super big and getting them on the plan. And I have a few guys I talk with every other week and, you know, they come up with a list of questions and it's always like, well, why are we doing this? Okay. Well, what's the next step? Like, how come, what should I, and it's too easy to break it down to like, you know, some clickbait ad where it's like, I guarantee 10% increase in three months. It's like, it doesn't work that way. And it's just a slow process, but having your athletes trust and, you know, and knowing that you're providing a lot of accountability with them is super important. Like just being a pro isn't a goal, you know, like what's going to get you to that goal. Like, how can we set up a plan to get you to that goal? You can't just say, well, I want to do 400 Watts for 20 minutes. It's like, well, why, what race are you doing that you need to be able to do 400 Watts for 20 minutes at? Like you're going to get beat nine times out of 10 by the guy who can do 350, but is knowing how to race, preparing for the race differently. He's not just doing threshold workouts or understanding like maybe I'm not a threshold rider. So I should focus on my strengths over weaknesses. So I think that's kind of the biggest thing. So just yeah, accountability. I, I think that, I think, yeah, the key words there is, 
Yeah. One, accountability. Two, structure. You know, yeah. and the, for the people, most people need that. They want to grow in the sport and uh, continue to uh, go through the ranks. Those are the two things that really stand out the most. And as you're saying that, as a coach, you, you have to learn the the art of coaching their needs, coaching to their needs and not their wants. Now you want what you want ideally is for their wants to be their needs. And, and that's the sweet spot. If, if you can line those things up because uh, their goals, uh, you, you know, their, their needs are going to have to align with their goals. And so if their wants are different, <laughs> then it's going to be a, you know, it's going to take you some time to win them over, to see the light, to understand why you, your job is to, is to steer them in the right direction and, and not just to be putting workouts in there so that they can say, oh, I've hired a coach and you're some, you know, you're trying to figure out how to find some fake fitness uh, and you know in your heart, this, this isn't really the right way to do this. And so, yeah, coaching needs versus wants is, is a big thing that you you have to really learn. It, it takes a while for that to sink in. And, uh, you know, once you, once you can do that and sell uh, and win over the athlete on that concept, it accelerates the growth. And I think a big part of that is just, um, I, I mean, this year, all three of us, I'm sure, faced with the pandemic. Everyone's goals basically got canned and thrown out the window. And that made us all have to readapt. It's like, okay, now what do we do? Like, you're as a coach, you're so used to seeing the plan out on paper and training peaks and the goals are in there a year and a half ahead of time. Like I already know what my summer should look like. And already that stuff's getting shuffled around. So last year, when all your travel plans get thrown out the window, when you know exactly how December should feel, you know how you should be feeling in January, you know, when your February rolls around, you're rolling into pretty good form. And then you're just kind of adding the speed stuff into March. And then you're really race ready and sharp by April. When all that got thrown out the window, I feel like as a coach, a lot of athletes were just in limbo. And as a coach, you had to basically adapt to, all right, how do we keep the athlete engaged? How do you, cause a lot of it is monotonous and very routine. And that's why a lot of people, they, you know, do coaching for a year, see a bunch of improvement, a bunch of gains. They don't quite get the race results they want. Cause it's not all just, you know, power base. It's, you got to learn how to race and stuff. But when all of that changes and now you're, summer looks totally different and you're trying to keep athletes engaged and on board and not just, you know, ramp them through the same six week cycle back off six week cycle back off. I, I found that was pretty challenging as an athlete. So just knowing, or as a coach, so just knowing um, how to adapt and how to stay in tune with your athlete mentally and physically. Cause you know, there's tons of stressors. They could have family problems. It could be, relationship problems, work could be stressful. Um, and that's going to affect their sleep. That's going to affect, affect what they're eating. And that in turn is going to translate into, you know, discrepancies on the bike and training and all that stuff. So being able to identify that and keeping an open door all the time as, I mean, you're basically a big brother, or a mentor, like, like you said, you're not just a coach. You're not just somebody that's like, here's your workouts. Goodbye. Like, I don't, I have very few athletes that that's kind of the relationship we have and that's what they look for. And not a lot of people can handle that stuff. They need the emotional support. And I had a lady that was coaching me and she was going through a divorce and stuff. And I, I told her, she's like, I can't really afford it, but like, I need this. And I'm like, don't pay me. Let's just be done. We can pick this up when you're mentally ready to train again. Like you're just doing this as your escape. And I don't want you to feel obligated to have to continue with me and coaching and, there's, I'm still going to respect you just as much as we can still be friends. You can still message me. It's just, we don't have to make it about training anymore. Like you're just in, not in the mental state for this anymore. So identifying that with athletes and not being, not being scared to step away from those relationships from a coaching standpoint, but keeping the door open as just a mentor, like you were saying is also important to identify. Yeah. Well, this, this year through all of our, uh, feedback loops out of whack and you're talking about a feedback loop you know with do the work go race the thing get the result you have the outcome adjust adapt circle back again you just the feedback loop got thrown out of whack and we as coaches had to create some new feedback loops and entirely revamp the system and i don't think we 
entirely figured it out, but we maneuvered through it and, and did the best we could. And so, yeah. So Zach, you know, your little coming into the, to the profession just really in the last year or so, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what for you do you think, what is some, you know, some key tips for someone to think is like, I, I want to get into this profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to echo one of the things that you said earlier um, in kind of a different way, like coaching your friends is a good way to start. As long as your friends aren't like world tour pros, you know, like don't mess up their season, please. But you, it, because what we've, we've essentially said is that coaching is about relationships, yeah, right? Bingo. And yeah. you're not just writing a training plan. Anybody can do that. There's software, there's pre-made plans. That's not what it's about. So by coaching your friends, you've skipped a step in a way of creating a meaningful relationship that's open where you guys are seeing eye to eye, right? You're already associating with these people. You know what their day-to-day -day looks like. You're skipping a lot of the steps and it's going to allow you a kind of a safe space to grow as a coach and to try things out on an athlete that's not going to fire you or be, you know, mad that they're hundred dollars or whatever it is. Uh, they felt that it wasn't well spent or you weren't managing them properly or something like that. Right. So begin by investing in your friends and in those relationships where they're already formed in a way. Um, because it's going to teach you a lot about like, okay, do I actually want to do this? Like, because they're going to be approaching you with problems and situations that you've experienced as an athlete. And now you have to figure out how to verbalize that in a way that's going to benefit someone else. And that was one of the biggest things for me being a huge nerd. Like I can tell you all the science stuff in the world, but like being able to translate that to a beginner level athlete who only needs to hear the surface level knowledge of this and an assurance that he's doing the right thing and he should not do a five hour group ride with his friends on Saturday because it will mess up his week. You know what I mean? Like, so being able to have that experience and pare things down from your past experiences in order to benefit people who already trust you is I think the most uh, beneficial and easiest place to start. Yeah, because trust, trust is tough. Trust is really tough. It's gold, right? It's worth its weight in gold. Um, yeah, exactly. And from there, because you already have this relationship, you're going to better understand what we feel is the need to serve these people in the best way possible, right? And so when I got into it, I was paralyzed because I just wanted to give them the perfect answer and the perfect plan and with all the science aligned perfectly, right? And you don't need to do that because their trainer's going to kind of unplug. Their power is going to go out. They're going to have a life event that changes all this, right? Perfect is impossible. But being in a situation that fosters growth on both ends, I think is the perfect way to enter the field. And then you can fill in the gaps through your need to appropriately help these people with the science, with the appropriate training plan, right? Because for most of these people, you're going to be, um, you're going to give them a consistency and an accountability that they need, and they're going to get better. And then you can hone in on the details and deficiencies that you have through the conversations that you have with these other people um, and do it in an organic way, right? Instead of start an LLC, get a bunch of clients, do an ad campaign. And then you're basically in, a situ in an impossible situation where you're trying to serve people that you aren't connected to in this, you know, everybody's got a different situation that you haven't experienced yet. So I would say start with your friends and give it some time in that situation and allow yourself to grow into the role and see what you actually want out of coaching. Um, because if you don't have like some weird visceral need to just like invest your emotional energy in someone else and be the cheerleader and be super excited for them and never get any recognition at all for the in investment that you placed in them, um, then it's not, a, it's not a good use of your time, man. Like do something else, find another avenue of uh, helping cyclists because being their coach is an emotional investment and it's a huge time contribution on your end to make sure 
that that silly little training plan and the 30 minute phone call or whatever that is, that interaction every week that you have with them is super motivating and super beneficial for them. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with that. And I think your advice about starting off with people, you know, I think what's even uh, uh, equally important to that is that you are going to have contact with them mm-hmm. and, and there's going to be some in-person element to it. I know all three of us have the benefit of being able to, see our athletes in person an awful lot. And that makes a huge difference uh, to, to help them according to their needs and, and help them uh, improve. But then we also learn a lot through that in person versus remote. I would definitely not encourage someone new into coaching to get straight into remote coaching. Uh, I think that that's going to present some um, aside from the logistical issues, just it won't really help promote your growth as a coach. Uh, get into it down the road after you have some experience and you really have your legs underneath you and you're like, you feel really confident about what you're doing. But I think starting out and with those around you and networking above and beyond what you're talking about, Zach, network. And that takes, that takes real work where you're showing up to races uh, you are visible in the community. You plug yourself into various situations. You're at the group rides. You, you, know, you are being seen. And I think that, that also goes a long way. And, you know, it's just one of those, it's like a, it's a passion, but it's also a labor of love because, you know, you're, you're already probably riding your bike. You're probably already racing, but this is a, you know, you got to get yourself to a place where, you can be comfortable going to a race and you're there in support of other people. You're not there for yourself. And that's what coaching is all about. It's not about you, the coach. It's about the athlete. You know, you, if you're in getting into coaching, you've probably already had your moment. You know, you, you, you've kind of had your moment. You guys are a little bit different. You're simultaneously coaching and you're also striving to have your moment. Most other people are not in that situation. Uh, they're, they've already had their moment and they may still race a little bit, but where they can contribute the most is, is helping other people have their moment. And you have to, when you're doing that, you have to step back and you have to devote yourself to it. And if you can do that, you'll get the most out of it <clears throat> and because you really have to pour your heart and soul into it. And it has to be a labor of love. And if you do that, then you'll get everything out of it that you want and need. And I think, I think it was you, Zach, who just said, you, you want to have an, a, an understanding of why you want to do this. What is it that you want to get out of this? Yes, you want to see your athletes succeed. Yes, you want to help them achieve their goals. But you have to have some uh, intrinsic uh, motivation in you, and you have to derive the joy yourself like you said, Zach, there's not going to be a whole lot of praise that we coaches get. It's not like we get a lot of recognition. Um, we all, as athletes, could stand to do a better job of showing appreciation to those that help us all along the way. We we're, we're, think humans in general are, are kind of guilty of praising other people for helping them. Uh, and so coaches don't get into coaching because they like to receive praise. You do it because you love to see the smile on your athletes' faces when they're experiencing a good outcome. And to me, that's what I, that's why I'm into coaching. Uh, and when, when an athlete has experiencing sadness or frustration or disappointment, I feel that too. I mean, I feel that because I probably had a hand in, in, in that disappointment. I know I did in some shape or form. And so, uh, you know, you, you, you can't just go into it wanting to experience the highs. You got to be willing to take on the lows just like the athlete does because it's a big investment by everybody. Agreed. Same. And we've all, I think we've all been, we've been all pretty fortunate. I think maybe that's even why we, we three have gotten into this profession is because we've been very fortunate to have been influenced and coached by some amazing coaches. Like they are among the best. 
mm -hmm. uh, in the business. You know, the guy that was my mentor, his name is Todd Nordmeyer. And you talk to anybody in the Southeast, they know who Todd Nordmeyer is. Uh, he goes way back, a hugely successful cyclist, but prominent coach. And he has been uh, a mentor to many. And I've been, I was very fortunate to get close to him. And uh, without him, I don't know that I would have become a coach. And, and then to, to then, yeah, meet these other people and get to be friends with them, get to know them as people, pick their brains. I think that's the thing that I enjoy the most is, is becoming friends with all the other coaches and learning, too, from their experiences and sharing stories. Hey, man, how did that work for you? Or I'm having this issue, what, what would be your suggestion? How would you handle this? Uh, and I think that's, you know, again, going back to mentors, you know, we're, we're only going to be as strong and uh, as successful as the type of people we surround ourselves with. And I think that's crucial, especially for coaches. Well, it's just any phone call with Ben Day, the dude's like a wizard. I'm like, I'm, <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. Like, you're just, he's all the way up here all the time. And I'm just like, all right. Yeah, that's why I don't question anything. Just put it on, put it on the sheet and I'll do it. And so like having people like that is just like, I mean, how many times, like I'm the slowest person that he coached, you know, like when you're coaching like the Yates brothers and dudes on Mitchelton and they're like, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll coach you. And you're just like, all right. Like, was that pretty good today? Like you're doing your best power numbers. Like, yeah, it's decent. It's not bad. Like, we'll see how tomorrow goes. You're like, ah, oh, just say good job. Yeah. <laughs> but you're just like, he just works with such high athletes, but it's also motivating because you know, you're, being steered in the right direction and mentored in the right direction. And yeah, I mean, he's the guy, like, I wish I recorded phone calls with him. Cause I'm just like, what did he, what, what were we talking about? Cause I need to like, go look this up or see what's going on with that. And then you have on the hindsight of that, like the first coach I ever had was terrible. Like he was like this, he had no ex actual race experience, which made it really hard too. Um, Cause then they don't understand like it's one thing to get somebody fast, but then when a lot of people, they also are looking for that race advice and like, Hey, how do I, how do I read the field? What should I like? What are some markers I should look for? Like, I mean, getting them fast is only half the way there. Um, getting the actual result is twice as hard as the training. A lot of times, you know, everything's got to go right. You got to play your cards, right. You got to, you know, just have that good day. Um, positioning's huge. Um, and so having somebody with that experience, that's like, you know, especially in the U S like the scene's so small that if you get somebody that's like, Hey, what's the third day of gateway cup? Like, you know, like, Oh, this corner is always rough. It always ends up in a field sprint because it's just too fast on the back stretch. But sometimes the wind can be out of this direction, which makes, you know, corner two to three strung out and hard, but you know, it'll bunch back up. So don't worry if you find yourself, you know, towards the back, you can make it up in this turn. So having that kind of hands-on experience makes coaching a lot easier. And then just, yeah, talking from your experiences is big. But then um, you have people like Ben, who, when I was going to Tour de Bose, I knew nothing. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't have time to recon anything. All I knew it was going to be hard as hell. And he's like, yeah, I've raced that. I'm like, dude, you've won it twice. Like, don't you have any other advice? He's like, <laughs> mate, I don't know. That was like a lifetime ago. I'm like, it was five years ago. It wasn't that long ago. Like, you're on the sh results paper twice. Like, I see your name. He's like, yeah, I think I've done it twice. I'm just like... But yeah. then, you know, the first coach I had was just like this constant, like we just were butting heads all the time. Like he was just kept trying to like, I mean, I knew from that time, I'm like, all right, I need more than nine hours a week. I'm not going to get any faster. Like you have to give me more. And then, then he turned to this like, oh, well, if you think you need more, here's six hour days every day. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I don't have time on this day and this day and this day, yet you schedule my biggest rides during that time. And uh, lo and behold, Davis Bentley, former LMC alumni, also worked for this coaching company and got me hooked up with another coach. He's like, hey, give it another shot. Let me get you somebody that, you know, he's a higher level coach. You can still pay the same rate. I'll get you a higher level coach. He's worked with, he's done a lot of the races you're looking to do. And he's like, you know, mm -hmm. and even the tension from that, you know, you could tell coaches were talking and he, it was a little rough start, but kind of once we found our groove and, you know, I gave it time, like I, the only reason I switched to Ben was from that coach to Ben was just to try something new. I'm like, okay, I've been with you for two, three years. I know your coaching style. I know what to expect. And I was looking for kind of just something fresh. Maybe was there a different way to do this better? So, um, mm -hmm. not, I, I mean, and that's pretty common. That's yeah. pretty common for, for 
professional cyclist to to work with a, a specific coach for a few years and then switch coaches and and try something new an mm-hmm. entirely new stimulus and way of doing things and a lot of those world tour teams now have their own in-house coaches where you know the athletes have to work with them but that's a common thing it was something uh, i know from every pro cyclist i know has worked with multiple ones and they take something from each one of those maybe that's a future episode for us is as an athlete how to hire a coach you know what are the things to think about and consider uh you know through that process uh you know how to go about hiring one why would you hire one what's the value in that uh, like you said a few minutes ago matt Sometimes some people, it makes no sense for them to hire a coach, you know, if they're not ready to be coached and being coachable is a critical component to, uh, to getting the most out of that relationship. So uh, there's a lot to think about, you know, when it comes to just getting off the ground, but uh, you know, there are a few things to do that, you know, that, that, that can put you on the right path and then just grow that experience and take off from there and stick with it. I mean, this sport, whether you are the athlete busting your tail, getting after it, or you're the coach, it rewards the people who stick with it. Just stick with it, believe in what you're doing, have fun, uh, help others have fun. And, you know, if you're already going to be in the sport, why not? And you have a heart for doing it, why not? Uh, and so just go about doing things the right way and treat other people well. Uh, and yeah, they're going to want to work with you. So, uh, I say, you know, go for it and keep the questions coming. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, that, that's something I obviously enjoy talking about uh, and enjoy doing. Well, it's funny how you talk about just rewarding people who stick with it. Cause um, the other day, like I was just, I was looking at something on my Instagram and I saw uh, a comment from uh, Zach and I's teammate, Peter Olnicek. And uh, it was one I last year got to, do two of Utah and race with that Canadian continental team. And uh, Peter's comment was, you told me once in 2014 on the bike path coming home from Schlitz park, it was only a matter of time and patience has gotten you here. So just like knowing how long it's going to take. And I mean, I remember being at LMC like junior year, it's like, Oh man, I did these power numbers, like racing the Hincapie guys, like, like, man, this is all it takes to be pro. Like I'm this close. And like a year goes by and another year goes by and like, all of a sudden it's every year you're at green mountain. It's like, Oh crap. This is, this is the end of the year. Like I, it's it's it. I got to wait till next year and do it all over again. And, you know, just, yeah, it's such a long process. So just sticking with it and the patient part is so important because I mean, I've got working with athletes, you know, you get a lot of like reminiscence of where you were, you know, at that time when you were first starting with a coach and, you know, they're struggling a ton and it seems like, you know, for two weeks, they're just hurting and hurting and struggling and, you know, they're getting demotivated and it's, and they're just suffering a lot. And then all of a sudden you get through that. And it's like, trust me, like, you know, what's on the other side, just like kind of stick with it. Don't focus on power, just complete the workout. Let's back off a little, but like, let's still keep that stimulus going and let's just push it a little further than you think you can go each time. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get past it and two years down the road, you look back at that, you go, Oh man, I can do that. I can do that five minute power for 35 minutes now. So like just seeing that growth and that's the great thing about, you know, we all use training peaks, being able to look back on that growth and you can remind yourself in the toughest times, go back and see like, okay, what did I do? What got me through? What was, what, what was I doing right at that time? So um, being able to track all of that is nice and just trusting the process and sticking with it is it's harder than easy said, but it's hard to, hard to execute, but once you do, it's, you find your good, you find that rhythm and it pays off. Yeah. And as a coach, I mean, you're the advocate, you know, you're the advocate for the athlete and that's your, that's your role, help them through all of that, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows. And, and that's the fun that, that mirrors life. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad you both are in it. And I'm, you know, it's exciting for me to see young people come through and, and be a part of it and take it and, and grow with it and help other people um, to, to pursue their passion. So plus this question. week, plus this week, my first client I've coached is going to LMC next year. So oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. in full circle. So we promised there was no exchange of payments of any kind to have you on this show <laughs> to get him to come to our school, but now we're excited to have 
Shay join us. Uh, I know he's excited. Yeah, he's uh, but we're, we're, we're equally pumped as well. And uh, so, yeah, looking forward to that. So, all right, guys, I think uh, we, have, we have gone on for a good bit here. We have. And, uh, <laughs> and so I think we should, uh, we should uh, wrap up the show. Matt, thank you for being on uh, the art and science of coaching today. We covered a way more ground than I thought we would. But, uh, but this was good. I'm glad you joined us. And uh, Zach, we'll have to, we'll have to you know, get another list of questions and dig into it again and see who, maybe some other coach we can round in here the next time and, and join us. So guys, I appreciate it. Uh, some good discussion. Yeah, thanks. Fun. Thanks.